Welcome to lecture four. Uh, today I'm going to go through eight habits of what makes an effective classroom manager. And most of these habits I list will be a synopsis and review of what we've already covered. Um, so you'll see me speed through those. However, I do want to spend some time on our last habit as we begin to move into specific types of behavioral supports. So let's get started. Habit one, effective managers maintain structured and organized classrooms with clear expectations and a strong academic focus. We know that a structured classroom is critical to successful classroom management. This requires a lot of thought on your transitions, classroom rules, an organized approach to teaching, and a thoughtful mind on how we can best organize those experiences and materials to promote learning. Think back to our focus on how we might be able to limit these transition times so that our instructional time is maximized. Also think back to how important it is to teach our students how to abide by our classroom expectations and rules. All behavior is learned, the bad and the good. Therefore, we must also teach appropriate behaviors. Our next habit should sound familiar. Our rapport with students can actually compromise, though, how effective we might be in classroom management. If we are constantly admonishing students for misbehaviors, but missing opportunities for behavior-specific praise, then we're in danger of promoting more of a negative classroom environment that doesn't feel good to be in. But by using a large number of praise statements, it can help promote a positive environment. But that can be difficult. So here's a challenge. Practice your use of positive praise statements by praising someone you know for 30 seconds straight with no pauses. You'll see that it can be difficult, but and a little awkward, uh, but it can help us get into the practice of providing dense amounts of positive praise statements. Habit three, effective managers are able to manage multiple behaviors at the same time. Uh, it's all about multitasking, folks. No classroom is ever going to have one behavior occurring at one time. It's probably going to be a dynamic environment in which there are multiple behaviors occurring at the same time. But when a misbehavior occurs, it is important for instruction to not stop. With everything you have, it's critical for you to respond appropriately to misbehavior while continuing to manage other students in the classroom. But having an effective classroom management structure can help alleviate students from being continually dependent on teacher prompting. So focus on a classroom structure in our environment in time that after they learn, the students can at one point function independently. Habit four. Think back to how we differentiated allocated time and engaged time on task. Those two separate pieces. The two should match pretty closely, but approximately 80% of our allocated time should have students engaged. But constant lecture-based teaching we know is notoriously known for promoting low rates of active student engagement. Think of ways to vary your instructional activities or delivery of instruction to help maximize our teaching and promote their learning. Habit five, provide opportunities to respond. This will present the teacher with immediate feedback on if a student or a group of students are in need of additional remediation or support. But more opportunities to respond can also limit disruptive behaviors and increase academic engagement. There is a wealth of literature that supports embedding more OTRs or opportunities to response in our instruction. You can provide more individual opportunities to respond choral opportunities to respond in which the whole class is expected to respond synchronously, or peer-to-peer -peer opportunities to respond in which a peer uh, responds with another peer, buddies up, and then comes back to the class to respond and share what they have. Habit six. Evidence-based refers to if a practice or skill has empirical support regarding its use. For a practice or skill to be evidence-based, though, it must have had a wealth of that empirical evidence that demonstrates it increased or decreased socially significant behaviors, and these are typically identified through experimental means. But when it comes to classroom management specifically, we don't want to guess what might work. We don't want to be willy-nilly with this. 
how many so think for example how many of you grew up with the color system in your elementary school classes as a classroom management system it was more of a stoplight system in which green was you're good to go yellow means caution or you're walking on thin ice and red means you messed up big time and there ain't no coming back and it would usually result in a phone call home or maybe loss of recess it's pervasively used in elementary classrooms but there's not an ounce of evidence that actually supports its use thankfully we see a trend in schools that are recognizing how damaging and ineffective it can be especially for our students in need of tier two and tier three levels of supports and interventions habit seven we want to respond strategically to student misbehaviors once we detect a behavioral incident has occurred we want to quickly and briefly address it keep a neutral affect we don't want to raise our voice necessarily and we don't want to come in too soft either we want to keep a neutral straight tone affect and provide the prompt for a correct behavior and then leave this is a fleeting exchange an interchange okay between you and the student the moment the student engages in what we asked we then inundate them with praise but if they don't comply we should restate our directives and maintain that neutral affect but then leave we don't want to engage in these power struggles these can be super detrimental to po promoting positive student rapport now we're going to also discuss this more in lectures five and six when we discuss how to respond to minor behavioral incidences and major behavioral incidences so we'll get to that and lastly habit eight where i wanted to spend the last bit of this lecture on we want to relevantly address problem behavior if it is severe enough and or occurs frequently enough this is especially important if a behavior compromises the safety of others or the person engaging in the behavior or if it interferes with their learning or the learning of others on a daily and continual basis this course does not address uh, behavioral assessment per se but i do want to briefly discuss something that we can conduct in schools called functional behavior assessment or the fba which is used to identify the purpose of a student's behavior we do this through a series of assessments and we look to see what in the environment could be contributing to the occurrence of problem behavior in the classroom now if you're currently teaching you can reach out to your administration school psychologist maybe special education teacher to inquire if a functional behavior assessment has been completed for a student that you think might benefit from one the simple logic of an fba though and the primary purpose of it is to guide the development of an intervention if an intervention addresses a student's uh, the problem behaviors function then we increase its precision and the probability that it might result in some success Let's take a look at the flow chart all problem behavior occurs to get out of something or to gain access to something for example if a student engages in problem behavior and we quit to reprimand it every time it occurs but the behavior continues to occur at in the future at near similar rates then we may be looking at a case where the student is engaging in behavior uh, to gain access to attention attention is attention whether it's good or bad in nature so even though it was a reprimand and we per se didn't necessarily let the student get away with it that was still attention therefore our reprimand is actually most likely reinforcing the problem behavior so what about also the student and this might be a common occurrence in schools too um, that you've seen uh, what about the student who engages in problem behavior anytime you transition the class to a new content area such as we're transitioning from social studies to math or social studies to writing this behavior may reliably occur at the start of the academic block but every time the student engages in this behavior uh, we send them to in-school suspension or ISS where they might get to hang out take a nap uh, and just enjoy some time away from what was an extremely non-preferred activity and possibly there might be even less follow-up in an ISS setting if this pattern continues then we be maybe negatively uh, reinforcing problem behavior 
Or in other words, a behavior occurs as a result of a stimulus or change that is typically removed because of it. By sending the student to in-school suspension, for example, we're actually providing escape. We might think that, oh, this is instilling, um, you know, we might be abiding by some justice system, you know, this is discipline. However, if the function of behavior is escape, then we're in fact reinforcing it in the end by sending them to ISS. We have to think of behavior in this way. It's so important to recognize what might need to change in the environment to improve behavior. Most times this calls for an individualized approach. So in the instance of providing escape constantly for a student who engages in behavior, what we don't want to do is the first step is to stop providing escape for problem behavior. We don't want to reinforce that behavior. Okay. From there, we would individualize an approach in which we provide escape for more appropriate demonstrations of behavior. Still escape is being provided, but for something totally different. We stop reinforcing problem behavior and we start reinforcing appropriate behaviors. There's more to that and more to it, and it's not that black and white, but it is important to begin thinking about behavior in this way, which leads us to the direction where we're heading for in this course. And I want to take a moment and share one example of a commonly used intervention you may have seen before. Um, it's called a token economy, and I don't want to go too into it because I am going to discuss this in our more individualized approaches as we continue, possibly in lectures six or seven. Okay. A token economy is a reinforcement system in which a student earns tokens following the demonstration of a desirable behavior. The student trades these tokens in these tokens in for backup reinforcers that would otherwise be unavailable. Now, this is a highly customizable intervention that can be used to treat a variety of challenging behaviors with different functions. Given that it can be customized, it can be individualized for our older learners as well, because as you see, this template, especially the one on the right, is probably more geared towards a younger learner. It can also be easily embedded into a classroom management system for individual students who display problematic behavior. Conceptually, a token economy is easy to understand. Students engage in the target behavior that we're trying to increase such as maybe task completion, if we're trying to increase the number of tasks that they complete in an academic block. Now, when they complete a task, they earn a token. They must earn a set number of tokens to earn access to maybe a preferred activity, such as five minutes on computer. However, in all of that, as conceptually simple as it might sound, there are many steps in between each of those that we need to discuss. Here are two examples I've, brief, I've briefly provided on the screen of a token economy. As you see, the student has an option to self-select reinforcers that they might be working for here, 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 and here. Okay. They must earn the required number of tokens to earn access to one of these reinforcers. Now, and here's one in which they have to have there's more of a requirement to a specific reinforcer that they're working towards. Now, here are the steps for developing a token economy. As you can see, there's quite a bit that actually goes into it. We want to begin with the behavior and identify our target behavior or the behavior we're trying to increase. Uh, we can individualize the token to match a student's interests, and we should always deliver it while synchronously providing praise. We also want to have a menu of backup reinforcers and what those tokens can provide access to. Determine how often the token will be administered and how many they need to get in order to get access to these backup reinforcers. Now, we can do this with a menu of reinforcers in which different things cost different amounts or where multiple reinforcers can cost the same number of tokens. Again, these can be highly customized to match the needs of our students. So that's the end of lecture four, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have.